Okay, well, let's begin with the word of prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Okay, this week, Isaiah 58, and we hear God's rebuke of his people. Uh, where we stopped last time, we heard two things in Isaiah 57. First, we heard about, uh, again, rebuking their idolatry. Uh, and uh, there are some references in there to the Israelites' false worship of Moloch. And then also, God nevertheless includes the promise uh, for those who are contrite, those who are lowly and humble in spirit, uh, that even he, you know, who dwells high and lifted up in the heavens also dwells with them. And he will give them peace. Uh, but where we ended at the end of 57, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. All right. So we're going to look more now, not so much at idolatry, but a little more at religious hypocrisy in Isaiah 58. So beginning in the first verse, cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. So that is the situation as it stands, that outwardly uh, the people have a religious facade. Um, and uh, outwardly they seek him daily. They say they delight to know his ways and they pretend as if they're a righteous nation. God is sending Isaiah once again to declare not their righteousness, but their transgression. Verse three, uh, mimicking them, they say, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Okay, so among their very showy works is their fasting. And we should talk about fasting because uh, we're in a funny spot as Lutherans uh, because uh, generally if you, you talk to your friends and neighbors, um, if uh, if they want to know the differences between Lutherans and Roman Catholics, sometimes they'll be like, so do you do you have to fast? You have to give up meat on Friday? And most Lutherans say, no, I don't have to fast. Do I'm a Lutheran. Uh, it is true that Luther himself is fairly critical of uh, fasting. Not fasting per se, but the sort of, uh, number one, hypocritical fasting. And also, as with most uh, good things, you know, the medieval church had turned fasting into something self-righteous, you know, meriting grace and salvation and things. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Luther had never said we should not fast. And in fact, the scriptures, uh, they don't have uh, commandments for the sort of parameters, you know, that some other Christians observe. But the scriptures do actually assume that people fast. And I always like to say, especially during Lent, uh, all Lutherans become diabetics. And they're like, oh, I can't. I just simply can't. You know, my blood sugar won't allow me. Like, okay, well. But uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, when he, he speaks of uh, the really spiritual disciplines, the things that we, we do well to focus on, not only during the season of Lent, but throughout our Christian life. Prayer, because he gives us the Lord's Prayer. Alms giving, alms giving, and he says, just don't sound the trumpet in front of you. Uh, and then he mentions fasting. Uh, right, as, as uh, was it, is it Solomon? Let not the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So, but Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you fast, 
Uh, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. So, in other words, exactly what the people in Isaiah 58 are rebuked for. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. They've got the accolades of men. But when you fast, anoint your face, or anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So, uh, and we could get into more uh, the purpose of those things. I like to remind people that um, you should never put something off unless you put something on. And that's true also when we repent of our sins. Uh, we should repent. We should turn away from those things. Uh, but we also have to be strengthened in our faith in order that we resist these temptations. So, fasting is the same kind of thing. Uh, if you if you fast for any reason, whether it's during Lent or anything else, and uh, you know you make the point to tell everybody about it, we're doing it wrong. <laughs> it's like Fight Club, you know, you don't talk about it. Uh, that's the one thing. The other thing is, even if you don't tell anybody and you sit there and you're hangry and miserable, this is also wrong. So, and actually, God will get to what He would rather His fasting people do, um, but. Uh, that that it's it's good opportunity then well gee if i'm not going to eat lunch or whatever it is then maybe i will devote my extra time to maybe i'll say my prayers uh maybe i can read scripture or a little more extra scripture than i usually would and and something that we'll see in isaiah 58 or maybe i can go out and be some good to my neighbor and then i won't think about being hungry and the deprivation then is actually spiritually beneficial not because we're punishing ourselves but because now you have more opportunity uh you know to serve your neighbor so there's that and then the other thing too that christians have always observed about fasting is that um, fasting is kind of a practice run for the deprivation that we might have to face uh, and it will not be a fast it will be something imposed upon us uh, and be be good to kind of acquaint ourselves with what is it actually like to to deprive myself of luxury and creature comforts uh, builds character. So, well, it's just kind of like when people went through the depression, and and you know, I had the interesting experience of going through several of these recession things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I got married. And, then you know, age, and now, and, you know, it's just, it is what it is, and you're just going to have to roll with it, and I always think about the poor souls who really, you know, I have a job, and I have income, what about those who have little to begin with, and now they're even snatching that away from them, because they put it out of reach, money-wise, mm -hmm. because they just can't find it. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> We do need to think about that a yeah. lot and, and just be thankful for the things that God has given us mm -hmm. and really help us out. That's right. So that's why I was, I don't know, I'm going to make sure that we have a really nice um, luncheon and everything for everybody. Because, you know, a lot of these kiddos that come here, they really don't have that much to eat. You know, a lot of them yeah. are poor. And um, that's why I always wanted dinner, because, and you, you'd be surprised how many little notes I got from kiddos mm. saying, that was really good, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, yeah. I think it is important for yeah. us to, you know, set ourselves aside a little bit, because you owe a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that way of giving to others is, makes it, I think, a really very constructive thing. Yeah, uh, yeah would be surprised like the world actually if I don't have every luxury that I want I will keep living and I can live well you know? <laughs> uh, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that have lost well, I have this little house and it's like why do you need a big house? I need a bigger house I have a fine house that's right that's all I need four walls a roof heat yeah uh, So that so that's Jesus' side of things. The other thing that uh, 
Lutheran has one little mention of fasting in the catechism um, in the sixth chief part on the Lord's Supper. And he's talking about worthy reception of the Lord's Supper. And uh, he has that comment. He says that fasting and bodily preparation are certainly fine outward training, but that person is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So again, we, we shouldn't jump the gun and say, he says fasting and bodily preparation mean nothing and you shouldn't do them. So I have this talk with the confirmation kids. I said, uh, what, what is necessary to worthily receive the sacrament is faith in what Jesus says, that his body and blood are given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. And I said, but what Luther says is that things like fasting and bodily preparation are fine outward training. In other words, they are good bodily disciplines. And I said, not just fasting, but when he says bodily preparation, I said things like, uh, don't go to bed at 4 a.m., you know, on Sunday, and know that you're going to get up in a few hours and go to church, you know, get your decent sleep on. I said, that's bodily preparation. Uh, I said, simple things like comb your hair, bodily preparation. Uh, dressing modestly and decently is bodily preparation. So I said, you know, uh, nobody else is really going to tell you these things, so I'm going to tell them to you. But uh, there's no reason. And I said, but it's also true. You could roll out of bed, put on no deodorant, and get here five minutes late, and you can still be worthy to receive the sacrament in faith. Uh, but these other things are helpful. So that's an extended introduction to say, so now we can see what God actually condemns when he condemns uh, the fasting among the people of Israel. Uh, he tells them straight away, uh, in the, this is three, in the three, behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. That would be a problem. You oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with the wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Uh, they have a lot of the outward things. Uh, we see in verse 5, he, God asked, do you think that it's to bow down his head like a reed? Very dramatic, you know, to spread the sackcloth and the ashes under him. Uh, so they've got, again, they've got all, yeah, exactly. They got all the ostentatious, like, outward things. They have none of the, the inward things. Um, so that that kind of, like, hypocritical religiosity. And not only that, but they're doing, in, in fact, the opposite of everything that they should do, that they are oppressing their workers, that they're wicked, um, that they're using this as an opportunity for pleasure, which I would take to mean that for their own gratification, that I can make a big show of it, you know, and everybody can see. See how humble I am? <laughs> Humility is one of my virtues. Uh, so, and so this is, you know, it's a good word for us to hear. Uh, let me grant, so we got here, let me grab some more. I didn't staple them in there. One, two, oopsie, gravity. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, Anne is the Bible lady, too. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we... Wait, what verse are we in? Isaiah 58, verse 6. All right, so the up to this point. Fasting, good in principle. Hypocritical fasting, bad. Uh, so Isaiah 58, 6. God still speaking. So the, this is not the fast that he has chosen for them to make a big show of their religiousness. Uh, but Isaiah 58, 6, God says, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. 
if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and spreading wickedness. So we'll just break off right there. So he, he says, all right, so this is the fast that I appoint. Uh, there is an element of fasting and deprivation that we should uh, take on in our life in Christ. And he does not say you should not fast from bread or your other pleasures in life. I always, I think it's funny. People are like, I'm fasting from chocolate. I'm like, well, that's okay. That's abstinence. But all right, that's fine. You're fasting from chocolate. That's good. Don't tell me anymore, please. Don't tell me. Uh, keep that between you and God. But that's fine. I don't discourage that. But uh, he doesn't say don't. I, well, t traditionally a fast is a fast from meat. And I do love my chocolate. But the meat, I don't know. I, that would be tough. But he, he does not say you should never fast, right? Just like we saw in the catechism. Fasting is good outward preparation. What he says is, here is the kind of fast, though, that I, as God, like best. Why don't you take a fast from sin? <laughs> Why don't you give that up? Uh, work at that. But and, and there's there's positive things that we do, right? Loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the straps of the yoke, let the oppressed go free. Uh, okay, so we we should, and I think it's Christians need to say this sometimes. We do strive for justice. Um, the Bible is really very clear that it's a horrible sin to oppress the poor. The things that the poor need is is really not a matter of mercy. Well, it is, but. It's not a matter of charity so much as it is a matter of justice. This is something that we need to deal with uh, in the midst of the other things that, that we're called to be faithful about. Uh, but he says, so why don't you fast from gratifying yourself with everything? Instead, verse 7, uh, is it not the fast? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? So you can't go ahead and give up your bread, but you don't have to give it up and then sound the trumpet before you and say, just, just so everybody knows, I am fasting. But instead, you know, take the bread that you're not going to eat uh, and give it to people who need it. And there's a couple of things here that I think they just echo in what Jesus says in Matthew 25. Uh, when he has, you know, he tells about the sheep and the goats at the final judgment. Uh, because here Isaiah explicitly mentions the hungry and the naked. Uh, and he mentions the homeless too. But Jesus, when he, when he judges the sheep, and he says, come on in, you, know, you who are blessed by my father. And they have this amnesia. They're like, oh, we haven't done any of those things that you said. Are you sure that I did them? And Jesus said, yes, because as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, You've done it to me. So, but that's passage specifically, Matthew 25. He says, I was hungry, so we heard that in Isaiah 58. And you gave me food, I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, there's the naked one. And you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And that's the sort of fast that God calls us to. Uh, that, uh, as we were saying, everything really is a gift. If that's the case, it's really no big deal. Then if I just continually hold out my hand and I receive all these abundant blessings from God, then what's the big deal? Just giving it to people who seem to need it more than I do because God will fill my hand again in all kinds of ways. Uh, and then we can just keep playing hot potato, right? I mean, this is really what the Christian life is, that God throws us something and hot potato, hot potato, I need to get rid of it. Throw it back to God. And then he makes it better than before and he throws it back to us. That's what worship is, you know. He takes bread and wine. He makes it to be Jesus' body and blood, you know. He takes water, makes a baptism. He takes our praises and our prayers and he answers all these things. Uh, and uh, it's clear that we struggle really to see things like this a lot of the time. Uh, but that's what it is.
Uh, throw it, throw it back to God. Throw it to your neighbor because uh, it's better that I not worry about it. And then watch as it's returned to us. And then we're like, "Oh, will you do it again, God? <laughs> throw it away." And then you know He blesses us again. So, so this is the way that we are to fast. So, if you have anything at any time, you go ahead and interrupt me. But because uh, I like, I like being interrupted. It's good. Uh, I really do. So, verse eight. So, if you do these things, then. Uh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. I didn't put it on the sheet, but that the beginning of verse eight, that reminds me of what Jesus says, Matthew five. He says, they will uh, see your good works, give glory to your father who is in heaven, but you are, you are the light of the world. That's what he says in Matthew. Um, so having said that, Squaring that with what Isaiah says. So not like the ostentatious, oh, look, I'm fasting. But when you actually do love your neighbor, yeah, don't make a big deal about it. But the, the word gets out, right? Uh, it's not you tooting your own horn. But when people know that you love and care about them, they will spread that. Uh, and people will inadvertently, really, they will see your good works. And our hope is always that this is the sorts of things that draw them into the life of the church. And uh, that's okay, you know, uh, for it to work that way. Um, and then they give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So, I lost my place. That was eight or nine? Nine, yeah. Okay, that was eight. Yeah, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Uh, something else that we should remember. Um, so if God calls us to do these things, then he also provides for us. Uh, that uh, it's not, you may not have to give to the church. You may not have to help these people. Well, I'm going to just end up in the poorhouse, you know, if I do it. Uh, the glory of the Lord will always be your rear guard. And um, Solomon, I think it's Solomon, in the Proverbs, he says, I've never seen the righteous beg for bread. And I found that, you know, I'm not saying I'm that righteous, but I have found this to be true in my own life. The, the Caitlin and I have talked many times, just even in our married life, we're like, God really has never, he's never abandoned us. <laughs> We've always had food, always had a place to live. Uh, the bills eventually get paid, you know, like it's, he really does, he really does, he provides. And sometimes it is the kind of thing where it's like, uh, you know, things that kind of fall out of the sky. But anyway, so the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And mind you, he's saying this to people who will be exiled. You know, they really will go through a lot of bad things. Now, in the moment, do they feel that the glory of the Lord is their rear guard? Perhaps not. Uh, but, but God is faithful to his promises that he really will do these things. And he, he further explains what that means, verse 9. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. So remember before, he had not answered them. And God had said, uh, where was that? The, the end of verse 4, uh, the hypocritical fasting. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. So, but when we do this in faith, we do these things that he commands. Verse 9, then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke, right, the oppression from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. So here's fasting for you. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the, the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. So there again, you kind of see Jesus language as the light of the world, city on the hill. They will see your good works. Uh, so this, again, is what we are to do. So we need to get rid of what he talks about at the end of verse 9. You got to take away the yoke, the pointing of the finger. I like that one. And speaking wickedness. And Jesus, in his uh, rebuke and condemnation of the Pharisees, uh, he talks about how there is a lot of this going on among them. And I gave you the quote from Matthew uh, 23. Bottom of page two and on to page three. Uh, but uh, 
The, the other part of the yoke is not just the oppression of the poor, but if you link that with the pointing of the finger, uh, you know, the Pharisees, they loved fasting. They loved all these different rules and regulations, and they liked wearing the phylacteries and the long robes, and the robes are cool, I admit. Uh, but, uh, but Jesus explains how it is that uh, the Pharisees use all of these things, again, like the people in Isaiah 58. This is really a fast for your own pleasure, you know, because it's, it's you um, exalting yourself, puffing up. But the way that, well, let me read what he says. Uh, Jesus says of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Okay. So in other words, legalism is such that legalism is like, uh, what was the game the kids played? Limbo. But the bar is high enough for you, Pharisee, to get under. It's never high enough for anybody else, right? Uh, or however you want to use the metaphor. But you, you always, you know, if you're a legalistic person, you, you always meet or exceed the standard, and everybody else, really strangely, never can. <laughs> Right? And so this is what they do. They have a fast that they can keep. And for the people, they bind on these burdens that they cannot, they simply cannot fulfill. Uh, either, you know, out of themselves or their conscience or whatever. Uh, so they, you know, the Pharisees, natural born supervisors, you know, they're like, load it up, very heavy burden. Uh, and then, you know, they crush the people saying that God requires these things. And what they do is they, they entirely crush them. They crush their conscience. And the Pharisee is not willing to lift one finger and help. He likes to point the finger. Uh, but uh, this is what many such things they do. So through Isaiah, God says, you need to take away the yoke, take away the burden, uh, take away the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. So... Let's see here. Now, what I find, uh, I mean, that can be that can be a problem. Uh, I think we live in a in a lot of respects a very different world from the world of the New Testament. Uh, I find that modern Christians, I guess it depends where you go and what church you're in, but but generally speaking, I think modern Christians err not so much on the legalism side, but on the lax and the permissive side, where it's uh, and I don't just mean things like fasting, but I mean like Sometimes we need to be reminded of those things that Paul talks about when he warns against using grace as a license to sin, you know, and uh, that uh, we do, you know, need to proclaim the law and all its harshness uh, so that the gospel can be good news. But it kind of depends, like, where you are. You know, in Luther's day, obviously, that was not the issue. The issue was it's works, works, works. And then not only is it works, but it's like made up works, you know, so that's even worse. Uh, so we really, in our Christian life, we can, individually, we can ping pong really back and forth. That uh, it really is true that uh, we, we walk a fine line in a lot of ways. Uh, entirely saved by the grace of God, completely and freely liberated by Christ, and also called to do the things that he says. And you will see that people either fall off on that legalistic side, or they're like, yeah, but the Christian life is about what I do. No. And then they go, okay, it's not. So I'll sin as much as I want to, you know, and God, God likes to forgive and I like to sin and, you know, it all works out. Uh, so we, we live with these tensions all the time. But anyway, okay, before I keep anybody, anything, okay. So verse. I keep losing myself. 11, right? Yeah, 11. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places. So even in scorched places. And make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. All right, so God will provide for them. He'll restore for them or restore them. And he uses these two images, 
The first is you will be like a watered garden. Well, also your bones will be strong. So that's good, you know, no osteoporosis. Uh, he will, you'll be like a watered garden. And that's something that he's made reference to before, beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one. Uh, he does promise that he will redeem Zion, but it's the rebellious and the sinner of whom he says, you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water. So the, for the sinner and the rebellious, they will wither away. Uh, but of course, so then, then the opposite is the righteous will be like a watered garden. Their waters do not fail. That's imagery that we see throughout the scriptures, that it really begins with Eden, that Eden is a well-watered garden um, and, uh, you know, that bears forth fruit. Uh, David says in the first Psalm that, that the man who is devoted to God's word is like a tree planted by streams of water, yields his fruit in a season, all he does prospers. The wicked are not so, right? The wicked are like the oak with withered leaves. The waters have failed. The tree is good for nothing but to be cut down and used as firewood. He uses that image. And then he also says that their ancient ruins in 12 will be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You'll be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. And it has not happened yet, as of Isaiah's prophesied, but what will happen? The destruction of the temple. So now it's true in a historical sense. Eventually, after the exile, 70 years, God will rebuild the temple. Uh, but uh, in a broader sense, of course, God builds these things himself, that he builds his church. Uh, that even, as we've talked about a lot recently, I think, even when the church looks like nothing to shake a stick at, God continues uh, to build on these foundations. And he does restore his people. Um, and the church will be the repairer of the breach. Verse 13, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, so if you truly honor it, not just outwardly, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So again, uh, all of these things God promises. He wants them to truly keep the Sabbath. So because he's been condemning, you know, this, this outward working in religiosity, uh, he says, what I'm speaking of, you have to truly delight in the Sabbath. So none of this talking idle or whatever it is that you do on the Sabbath, but if you truly honor it. And we would say, so to hear God's word and gladly keep it uh, by faith. If you will do these things, uh, then you will take delight in the Lord. So that's an interesting conclusion to draw them. So they've been driven by their own pleasures and all of these things. Well, what you need, you know, when we really want to do the things that God commands, then there has to be a change of the heart. So God says, your delights will change. If you hear God's word and you honor him, uh, if you, you faithfully keep his word, uh, then your delight is no longer in receiving, you know, the accolades of man, but it becomes in delighting in God himself. Uh, the psalmist says, delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Uh, well, if this happens, you honor the Sabbath, then you will take delight in the Lord. And among God's delights is he says, I will make you to ride above the heights of the earth. Uh, that I will exalt you. That's something we saw last week, that the Lord himself is high and exalted, and he actually wants to share all of these things with us, that he wants us to rule and to reign and to have all good things in Christ. And so this is what uh, he gives to us. And he will continue to provide for us. He says, I'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so he nourishes us all along the way. So... Even when you fast. Uh, any closing thoughts? Any comments? Good to go. Okay. Well, in that case, let us uh, close with the word of prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you 
uh, that uh, we do not merit uh, or can achieve the salvation that you give to us. Uh, we thank you for the assurance that you give to us that uh, you have accomplished these things. And we thank you that even as by your spirit, you regenerate and renew and restore us, uh, that by that grace, you give us the power then to do those things that you command. And we pray that you would help us to do them gladly. We ask that as we hear your word, uh, as we keep your Sabbath, that you would change our hearts, give us your delights, uh, that we might serve you uh, and do those things that you call us to do, but that in all things we would always trust uh, in the great mercy that you give to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray now that you would prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into your house, as we join together with all your saints, as we praise and worship you and receive all of your gifts, may it be for our benefit, for our life and salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you.